All right, we're back in another Sound of Battle Cry. We are back here and we doing a second part to the self-defense teaching today. I am glad to be back. I am here in my new house and in my new Sound of Battle Cry studio. And uh, it's good to be here. It's good to be back. It's good to be moved into my new place. And uh, I am very thankful, thankful to the Lord for all that. And uh, so I just want to give thanks to the Lord for that. And uh, let's see, anything else I want to say before I get into this? Uh, just pay attention. There's going to be more teachings and more shows coming out soon. I'm going to be more on a more consistent schedule. i uh, got a lot of shows planned for the future, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Please uh, share these videos, like, and subscribe, and uh, all that good stuff. All right, let's get back into this. So last time we uh, covered the issue of self-defense, but um, I need to finish this up with the second part. Probably will be the last part. And um, I'll just briefly review what we covered last time. Not in too much detail, but... Um, you know, I refuted uh, arguments against self-defense. Some people say that um, you can never defend yourself or your family or innocent people under any circumstances. You cannot use violence. You cannot use firearms or a weapon or your bare hands even. You can't even use anything to defend yourself. And um, they take this pacifistic stand. And um, But we show from I showed from the Bible... That that is a false stand. That's a wrong stand to take. But also, I don't swing really far in the other direction to be a warmonger, a war hawk, and um, to think that you know America needs to be the the world's police going around and invading countries and and um, toppling their governments to install uh, a government that we deem to be okay with you know and. Um, all that type of stuff. I'm totally against that as well. And um, war when it's unnecessary and, and killing when it's totally, unless it's totally necessary, I'm totally against it. Violence is, is bad. The Bible says, him that uh, loveth violence, his soul hateth. God hates those that love violence. So this show, and the past show and this show in no way is promoting the idea that violence is the answer to all to all or even most situations absolutely not it's a last resort it's something that only needs to be used in specific instances and we're going to talk about that more in this show but anyways just to briefly review what we talked about last time we talked about how um, the commandment of thou shalt not kill god tells you not to kill but then there's all these commandments of God commanding people to kill, such as David. He killed his tens of thousands and and other people. Um, Joshua was commanded to kill people. Uh, Samuel hewed Agag in pieces. All these different instances, and it wasn't a sin. Why wasn't a sin? Because it wasn't murder. The Bible says in Jesus, when Jesus quoted that, he said, thou shalt do no murder. What is murder? Murder is unlawfully killing a human, human being with premeditated malice. So it's hatred in your heart and it has to be premeditated. That's murder. If it's killing in self-defense, it's not murder. When someone's trying to take your life, and that's just a plain and simple fact. All right, so we talked about that. We covered that and how it teaches that in the Old Testament. Um, then all the commandments God gave to kill in war, the commandments that God gave for capital punishment to kill people for certain sins. So that is... Um, under the thou shalt not kill thing, and then uh, killing a thief that breaks into your house. Then we covered the issue of turn the other cheek. Um, that's a minor offense. It's not when someone's trying to kill you. Uh, love your enemies, which was in the Old Testament as well as the New, um, and how it doesn't contradict that teaching. Avenge not yourselves. We covered that. Uh, Peter p told to put away the sword. Those who take the sword will perish with the sword. We'll, we we covered that argument. And uh, that, that was basically it. So go back and listen to that teaching. If you haven't listened to it, please. Um, and then come back and listen to this one. But anyways, now we're going to move on. 
and we are going to talk about something. But before we continue and get into the meat of this teaching today, I had one more scripture to add under that first section of the last teaching of the thou shalt not kill. So um, God gives the commandment, thou shalt not kill. But then there's ex- there's exceptions where people kill, saints kill people in the Bible. Excuse me, saints kill people in the Bible and it's not a sin. Well, here's another example and it's in the New Testament. Okay, so the two witnesses kill people in the book of Revelation. So if you turn on over to Revelation chapter 11, starting in verse 3, it says this, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Revelation 11, three through six. Okay, so it clearly says here, and I do believe that the two witnesses are two people. Okay, it's not symbolic of something else like some people have said it represents the Old Testament and the New Testament or churches or some other thing. No, it's two people because it clearly says that the that they will be killed these two people, these two witnesses will be killed and their bodies, their dead bodies will lie in the street and not be buried for three and a half days. They will be resurrected and ascended to heaven. Those are two people. Now, I'm not going to speculate today whether they're Moses and Elijah or Elijah and Enoch or, um, you know, Zerubbabel and Joshua and all that other stuff. I'm not going to speculate about that today. It's not about two witnesses. The point is, that these two witnesses killed people, fire proceeding out of their mouth, devouring their enemies. In this manner, he must be killed if anyone hurts them. So very clearly, that is an exception to the commandment that God gave everyone, thou shalt not kill. Why? Because it was an exception because these two witnesses were killing their enemies And it's a specific judgment upon the wickedness of men in the end times, okay? Now, I'm not saying that we can go around doing that and that we're the two witnesses. The point is just further evidence that you can't just say, thou shalt not kill, as if it's an all-encompassing statement with no exceptions. You have to read the full context of the whole Bible, including all the case laws in the Old Testament, and then exceptions like this in the New Testament, okay? All right, so that's that point. Let's get into the meat of this teaching. All right, now for this teaching. Now, so last teaching mostly focused on arguments that people use against self-defense. But now we're going to talk more about commandments that are given to use violence to protect. Okay, so commandments to protect. Number one, your family. First Timothy 5.8 says this. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. An infidel is a lost man. Okay, so if any provide not for his own, what does that mean? Provide everything. Food, clothing, shelter, because the Bible says, let us uh, with food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So God says those are the necessities. Food and clothing shelter, a place to live. And what else? Protection. Okay. Provide means provide everything. The man in a family, the husband and the father are supposed to provide for that family. And it's supposed to be providing everything. Now you're telling me he provides food and clothing and shelter, but he does not provide protection. And God has built a man to be stronger physically with muscles than a woman, but he's not supposed to use those muscles to protect his wife and children. If they're being attacked by someone who wants to kill or rape them or both, he's not supposed to protect them. You are out of your mind. Okay. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay. You are supposed to protect and your family. And that's part of the providing. Okay. Of your own house. 
especially of those of your own house. And if you don't, you've denied the faith in your worst than an infidel because you would see someone breaking into your house or trying to attack your family and you do nothing. Okay? I don't know who came up with that teaching, but it's absolutely ridiculous. All right, let's look at another scripture supporting this from the Old Testament, Nehemiah 4.14. And I looked up, I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, be ye not afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. Fighting for what? A righteous cause to protect your family and your houses right there. A commandment in the Old Testament. It's just setting the precedent right there in the Old Testament. It's showing clearly that this was something that was a given, that men would fight to protect their family. Okay? It's not a new or a strange concept. It's not an evil concept that you would fight Okay, to protect your family. Fighting to protect your family is a righteous thing to do. Okay? It's not a sin. And don't let anyone tell you that it's a sin. They are deceived. They don't know what they're talking about. Or they're lying to you. Okay? Because who wouldn't want you to protect your family? I know. The devil. That's who. Because he wants to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what the Bible says the devil wants to do. All right, let's continue. Commandments to protect your property. Well, we have first yeah, the opposite of thou shalt not steal. That's the point I'm saying here. Exodus 20, 15 says thou shalt not steal. So why did I put that commandment there? Well, because the opposite of every commandment in the positive sense is true. For instance, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. The positive, that's negative, thou shalt not. So the positive is, thou shalt preserve life, okay? So the commandment here is also a negative, thou shalt not steal. So what's the positive aspect of that? Thou shalt preserve your property, protect your property, okay? And it also means giving too. Um, so if you... And then the, a further commandment to back this up is in Exodus comes right after that. So we're given the summary of the commandment here, thou shalt not steal, in Exodus 20, 15. But then in Exodus 22, verses 2 and 3, we have this. We talked about this in the last teaching, but we're going to um, cover it again. It says, if a thief, so what is this guy doing? He's coming in to steal. It's a thief, right? And the Bible, what does the Bible say in the New Testament? The thief cometh not for but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And we often talk about that as the devil. But right here we have a thief. If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall be no blood shed for him. If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he shall make full restitution. If he have nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. So if a thief was caught, if he broke in at night, and he was killed, no blood was shed for him. You were not guilty. It was not a sin. But if it was during the day and you could actually see him and who he was and what he was doing, if he was armed, you weren't supposed to kill him. But you were supposed to stop him, catch him, bring him to the civil government, and then he was supposed to make a full restitution, which was usually restore what he stole fourfold. Okay? So, you would have to physically stop this person in modern day times, you would um, subdue the, the thief, place him under citizen's arrest, call the police, wait for them to show up, deliver him to the civil authorities. They would determine there'd be a trial. They determine if he's guilty. If he was guilty, then the punishment should be he should have to restore fourfold what he stole. Okay? But nevertheless, you should be able to subdue, you're supposed to subdue the man that's trying to steal your stuff so he can be brought to justice, okay? And that will deter other men from committing crimes when crime is punished. The Bible clearly says, I believe it's in Ecclesiastes, it says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are set in them to do 
evil. Okay? Because men don't see a sentence against an evil work executed speedily, a speedy, a speedy trial. They're brought to trial, they're found guilty, and they're punished because people don't see that. They say, hey, we can get away with it. Let's go commit a crime. It doesn't matter if it's stealing or killing or whatever it is. They th- they are emboldened to commit more crimes because they don't see the um, perpetrator perpetrators being punished. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. You know, um, you call the cops, and the cops usually don't prevent crime. They show up after crime has already been committed. Okay, so a lot of times a thief he broke in. And what? If you don't do anything, he's going to take your stuff. He's going to run out the window or something, and he's going to run away. And then they might catch him. They might not. But if you catch him, subdue him, then you can hold him till the cops get there, and he will be brought to justice. And that is a good thing. Okay? That is a good thing when crime is punished in a society. All right. Now... Uh, there's another one where, where in G- there's another scripture. I didn't put it in here, but Jesus talks about how um, that you can't break into a house in, in, unless the strong man is bound, except he first bind the strong man. What does that imply? It implies that a strong man, a man is going to be guarding his household so that his goods can't be spoiled. And the only way to break into the house is to bind the strong man, tie him up, subdue him. Okay, so it's, it implies that he's going to be protecting his house. It's not that foreign of a concept. This whole country was built on that concept. Okay, that every man was supposed to take responsibility for himself. And that we had the, the they created the civil government. What's the role of the civil government? It's to help to protect life, liberty, and property. Okay. But if they can't get there in time and they're trying to take your life, you stop them. If they're coming to take your property, you stop them. If they're coming to try to take your liberty away, the government's supposed to stop it. You're supposed to pass laws. You're supposed to not pass any laws that would take away your liberty. And Benjamin Franklin said, those who would trade liberty for security deserve neither. Okay? Because freedom is dangerous okay we're not supposed to have this giant out of control huge federal government that takes care of all our needs and protects us from everything and gives us absolute safety at the expense of our privacy and our freedom that's not what we're supposed to have here freedom is dangerous and that's why men need to take responsibility for themselves so that they can protect their life their liberty and their property and then the, and then the civil government will conduct the trial and execute uh, the sentence, okay, against the criminals. That's how it's supposed to work. But that's not going to, that can't fully work unless men take responsibility themselves, okay, to protect their life, liberty, and property. All right, now let's continue. We could go down a rabbit hole with that forever, dude. All right, let's continue. Strangers be okay. So we got commandments to protect your family, to your property, and now commandments to protect strangers. Okay, and we give this uh, instance right here in the Old Testament of a woman being raped. You were supposed to stop it. All right, let's take a look at this. This is from Deuteronomy chapter twenty-two, starting in verse twenty-three. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both unto the gate of the city, of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, remember that for later, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, that means to rape and lie with her, then the man only that lie, lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this 
matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. Okay, so let's take a look at this. When a woman is being raped and she cries out, anyone close enough to hear it is obligated to go and save her, right? Because it says there was none to save her, which means subduing the male attacker. It doesn't say call the cops. It says if you hear the cry, you go and help. This is built into the DNA of men. It should be unless you're effeminate. Then you don't care when you hear a woman being attacked and someone attacked and someone's trying to rape her. You don't care. Hey, I'm just going to walk on by and, uh, you know, I'm going to cower in the corner. I'm going to cry like a baby. I'm going to, I'm going to run away. Oh, that poor lady. I'm not going to do anything. No, it says the, the betrothed damsel cried and there was none to save her. Now, what's the difference? Because it says there's a difference between being in the city and being in the field. I'll tell you what the difference is. People, if she's being raped in the middle of a field and she cries, there's none to save her. If he found her in the field and she cried, there was none to save her. There's no one around. They're in the middle of nowhere. So she can cry all she wants and no one's going to hear her. But if she's in the city because she cried not being in the city, it says if she didn't cry out in the city, then it wasn't really a rape. Okay. It was fornication. But if she did cry out in the city, the implication is that there's a bunch of people around and there should be some to save her. How would he have to save her? To come over and to beat that rapist off of her, subdue him, and deliver him to the civil authorities where he would be put sentence to death. Okay? It says he should be put to death. So shall you put away evil from among you. Okay, you shall stone them with stones. And if the man it's in a field, you shall stone him alone with stones. Okay? Because it says, For as when a man riseth against a neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So it's saying that rape is equal with murder. So it deserves the death penalty. It says it right there. It's the same thing as killing. Very, very serious sin to rape. And I know this, that I personally know multiple women who have experienced this crime. And let me tell you, it affects them for the rest of their life. It is a very, very wicked sin. And it deserves the death penalty. Okay, and that's what the Bible says. Now, it is very clear that if they were in the city, someone, whoever was closest by and they heard the cry, they're obligated to go save. So this person, it doesn't say this person has to be your family, your wife, your children, or anything else. This could be a total stranger, a stranger being attacked, someone's trying to rape her, you and whoever was near that heard the cry was obligated to go and stop the crime from happening and save the woman. There it is, plain as day. Okay? Now, are you starting to see where these pacifists are out of control and they're cowards? That's really what it boils down to. Okay? These cowards are effeminate. They're very soft-spoken and, and, they, and, they, and they try to pretend like they're really godly. And they're just humble and so, and they're gentle and they say, we should never use violence. That's not what a Christian should do. Blah, blah, blah. That's a bunch of trash. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? The Bible teaches a man is supposed to go and stop the crime from being committed. The woman from being attacked. Okay? I hope I made this very clear. Because it is, there's an epidemic of cowardice that men don't want to stand up and be men, take responsibility, be strong, quit you like men, gird up your loins like a man and do what has to be done. And they make this excuse, well, the Bible teaches this. 
turn the other cheek and love your enemies as an excuse to be a coward and not go save a woman that's being raped and just stand by and do nothing. It's preposterous. Okay? And Satan loves that teaching. Hey, stand by and do nothing. You know? While I ra- while while Satan rapes and uh, inspires men to rape and kill and 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 steal and and do all manner of wickedness and just be, yeah, just stand by and do nothing cuz that's what God wants you to do. He just wants you to be good little Christians and never intervene in any of that cuz that's not right. That's the voice of the devil. All right. And I hope to God today, I pray that you see that that's the voice that you've been hearing that's been trying to push this teaching on you. Because it is the responsibility of a man. If something, if a woman is being raped or something else like that is happening, you're required to do whatever you can to put a stop to it. Okay. And we're going to talk about practical tips later, okay? Now I'm not talking about, okay, every time there's like a a guy and a girl having a fight and stuff like that because sometimes men have intervened in that type of stuff and the the woman turns on them. They both turn on them. Um, Sometimes that can get pretty dicey. But we're talking about a clear-cut case. Let's say someone is being attacked and someone's trying to stab them or kill them or trying to rape them it's very clear what's happening a woman is screaming out for help you're obligated to stop it to do whatever you can okay all right very clearly the bible teaches let's move on to the next one the poor and needy deliver them out of the hand of the wicked what does the bible say psalm 82 verses 3 and 4 defend the poor and fatherless do justice to the afflicted and needy Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. We are obligated to deliver the oppressed and the innocent out of the hands of the of wicked men. This is a principle that is all throughout the Bible. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. Okay, if the wicked are oppressing the poor, the fatherless, the afflicted, the needy, you are supposed to rid them out of the hand of the wicked. It's the same principle, okay? Let's read another one. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Ooh, that one should be convicting to you. Okay, if you forbear, what does forbear mean? It means if you don't do something that you should do. That's what it means. If you hold back from doing something that you're supposed to do. Well, what does it say? If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn into death, those that are ready to be slain. What does that mean? If you don't try to deliver someone that's about to be killed, ready to be slain, drawn unto death, someone's trying to kill them. And you say, oh, I didn't know. I didn't see anything. We all, we knew it not. Hey, I didn't see anything. I didn't know that someone was about to be killed. Does not he that pondereth the heart consider it? You know what that's saying? You say that you didn't know what happened, but God knows. God saw it. God knew that you knew. And he knew that you walked on by and you did nothing. Someone that was about to be killed. Hey, not my responsibility, right? No, no big deal. No, I didn't know. I didn't know, right? Hey, Bible says, supposed to love our enemies and turn the other cheek and avenge not yourselves. So I can't do anything. You know, I'll just walk on by and I'll pray that, oh, I pray that someone will come along and help them. I'll pray for the police to stop that man from being murdered but i'm not going to do anything myself because that would be wrong well guess what proverbs 24 11 says you forbear to deliver them and god saw it and he knew that you were pretending like you didn't see anything 
but God knows your heart and he knows that you're guilty. Very serious stuff. This is straightforward, man. The Bible says very clearly that it is a sin to ignore when people are being oppressed, when they're being attacked, when people are trying to, when, when wicked men are trying to kill people and trying to rape people, it should be in your DNA, man. It's just naturally within you. You see something happening bad to someone. You go, oh man, oh, I need to stop. Need to, someone needs to do something about that. And if you don't, there's something wrong with you, boy. I don't know why I just said boy like that, boy. <laughs> uh. But there is something wrong with you. Okay? You need to really check your heart. That something within you doesn't go, man, that needs to be stopped right now. Instead, we dwell in a culture today that will videotape it, take pictures and video from their cell phones and watch as someone is stabbed or shot and bleeding to death on the concrete and they won't do anything about it. Even after that, someone's already been attacked and the attacker's gone, they won't even try to help them, carry them, wrap up their wound with the, with the bandana or their shirt, anything that they can do. Nope, they're just going to watch, videotape, and do nothing about it. That is cold-hearted empathy and indifference. Uh, sorry, I didn't say empathy. Cold-hearted apathy and indifference. And God is against it. Just take a look at the parable of the Good Samaritan for a clear indication of that. The priest walked on by, the Levite walked on by, but the Samaritan had compassion on the man that was wounded and laying on the side of the road. He poured the wine and the oil in his wound. He bound him up. He brought him to the hotel, the inn, and he, and he paid the money for it. And he said, anything that he owes, I'll pay the rest. That's loving your neighbor. That's having compassion on someone that you don't even know. Not taking a selfie and a videotape of them and trying to put it on YouTube to get, get some views. That's wicked as the devil. shows a society it's an indication of a society that has lost compassion they're completely desensitized to violence because they watch disgusting they're entertained by disgusting movies and video games where people are murdering each other torturing each other you got vain video games like call of duty where it's just murder over and over and over again movies like saw where people are being entertained entertained by human beings being tortured to death and people actually get a kick out of that pleasure and enjoyment and be are being entertained by it it is completely sick and twisted and all the killing that and violence that's in every single show and movie tv movies and video games over and over and over again you don't think and they say oh it doesn't affect me it doesn't affect me it doesn't affect me well guess what when someone's hurt in front of you they got stabbed and shot and you don't do anything about it except videotape it it affected you very clearly it affected you it desensitized you so much that you're a dead zombie with no emotion no compassion for your fellow man it's a very serious situation. And what did Jesus say about the end times and the si one of the signs of the end of the world coming? He said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And when you're sitting there watching someone bleed out on the street who just got stabbed and you're taking a video, your love has waxed cold. That's exactly what has happened. But... Doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? The answer is, yes, he will. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. God will. And you better be. Get right with God now before it's too late. Jeremiah 22. 
verse 2. And say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, that sittest upon the throne of David, thou and thy servants, and thy people that enter in by these gates. Thus saith the Lord, execute ye judgment and righteousness, and deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor, and do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow, neither shed innocent blood in this place. Jeremiah 22, verses 2 and 3. So once again, we see this theme again. Okay? And it and, and who was giving this, who is this commandment given to? Okay? Because it wasn't just given to the king. Okay? It says, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah. And, he says, thou and thy servants and thy people that enter in by these gates. So this message was to everyone in the kingdom, okay? And it was a commandment. Deliver the spoiled out of the hand of the oppressor. Commandment. Do no violence to who? The stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. Over and over again, those are the innocent victims that the Bible says you're not supposed to hurt, do no violence to them, deliver them, rid them out of the hand of the wicked, protect them, neither shed innocent blood. It doesn't say don't shed guilty blood because it says, whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. That commandment of the death penalty for murder was given even before the law was given. That was given to Noah and his sons. Okay? That guilty blood, the only way innocent blood could be paid for was with guilty blood. That's how guilty blood had to be shed. And it's not murder. Okay? So there's another commandment along the same lines. Let's look at another one. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. There it is again. Relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. We're supposed to relieve the oppressed, whoever is oppressing from whoever is oppressing them. This commandment is over and over again. So we got the commandments to protect your family, your property, strangers from being attacked, the poor and the needy from murder, from rape, from thievery, from all these types of crimes. That is a righteous, that is the righteous thing to do, and God commands you to do it. All right, let's move on to the next very controversial topic of war. All right, war and the military, military service. Okay, so some people say it is a sin, absolutely no matter what, in every circumstances, in every circumstance, for a Christian to join the military. Okay? But let's look at a few scriptures here that with John the Baptist, Jesus, and Peter. Military service not rebuked by John the Baptist, Jesus, or Peter. Let's look at John the Baptist first. And and we're don't worry, I'm going to add more commentary about the military service in war. Okay, trust me, we're going to have a clear perspective on it by the end. John the Baptist, uh, Luke chapter three, verse fourteen, and the soldiers. Likewise demanded of him. Okay, so all these people were coming to John the Baptist uh, to be baptized. And he said, bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. And then they were asking him, okay, what should we do to show fruits meet for repentance? And the publicans asked him and different, diff different groups of people asked him, what should we do? What should we do? And then the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto him, do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. So the question is, why would he tell them to be content with your wages if they're not even supposed to be soldiers? You're not even supposed to be a soldier. So why would you say be content with your wages? Be content with what you're getting paid to be a soldier. He didn't say leave. Okay. So Roman soldiers were notorious notorious for doing violence to people to for extorting them falsely accusing them to get more money because they weren't content with their wages so they would use their position of power and authority to extort people to get money from them to steal them to lie about them and uh, they abused their position of power and he john the baptist told them to repent of all those things is don't do those anymore 
And uh, but he never said, don't be a soldier anymore. He never said that. Now, let's look at another um, instance. Jesus from Matthew chapter eight, verse starting verse five. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, which was a soldier and beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it undone unto thee. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. So once again, Jesus said nothing whatsoever about the centurion being a soldier. He never told them to stop being a soldier, to repent of that, to repent of taking up arms or any of those things. Never said that. But in fact, instead of that, what he said is he used this man as a example of faith. He said, I've not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. What was the example of faith? It was the man talking about having soldiers under him. He said, I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers under me, under me. I command them to do this. And, and Jesus said, that's a great example of faith. You know, he never said, oh, what a terrible uh, example you've given me talking about soldiers. That's so wicked and evil. How could you use soldiers under authority as an example of faith? Nope. Didn't say anything of the nature, did he? Didn't say anything of the sort. Okay. So once again. Nothing said about military service being bad there. Let's look at another example. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, and then we'll skip to verse 34, 35, and then verse 47 and 48. All right, Peter. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, he was a soldier, of the band called the Italian Band. A devout man, and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Okay, so you got a soldier that the Bible says feared God with all his house. Verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Verse 47, can any forbid water? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay, so he did not condemn them. Peter never condemned him for being a cent uh, the centurion from being a soldier. Never said you need to repent of that. You need to stop being a soldier. You need to repent of this. Nothing of the sort did he say. Neither John the Baptist, nor Jesus, nor Peter condemned the soldiers for being soldiers. Never, not one time. Where do you get this idea that it's inherently evil to be a soldier? Where? Where do you get it? You don't, you don't get it from the Bible, okay? So let's continue here. Did you ever consider that it was soldiers with weapons that delivered Paul from a crowd of people trying to kill him? Okay? Acts chapter 21, verse 30. And all the city was moved, and the people ran together, and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they were about to as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he had done. And some cried one thing, some another among the multitude. And when he could not know the certainty of for the tumult, 
for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. A group of soldiers protected Paul the Apostle from being killed from the violence of the people. Okay? So if these soldiers are always bad in every instance, then why did God use them to protect Paul? Okay? It doesn't make any sense. They did something good in that instance. They were used for something good. It's not always for bad. Okay? So, I'm not here advocating, definitely not advocating for service in the modern day U.S. military or military service in every instance, but I'm saying you can't say it's absolutely universally condemned in Scripture for all Christians. It's not true. It's not true at all. It's an individual's decision for every man, and he has to make the right decision. And if he does become a soldier, he has to make sure that he does not do anything sinful when he is a soldier. Clear as day. All right, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, this kind of ties this ties in together with this concept of being in the military. We are not supposed to fight for an earthly kingdom to convert people at the edge of the sword. But it is biblical to fight to protect family, neighbors, and country from invaders, terrorists, and tyrants. Okay? In John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. So Jesus is saying, I'm establishing the kingdom of God, a spiritual kingdom, it's not like the kingdom of Israel. We don't fight to for a uh, earthly territory. We're not fighting for territory for a holy uh, kingdom, a theocracy. Okay, America or any other country is not a theocracy. Okay, that's not the kingdom of Jesus that that we were supposed to be fighting for. That's not what it's talking about. Okay, or that's not what we should be doing. And that's not what I'm talking about. When we're talking about military service, it's only specific instances, like I said, protect family, neighbors, and country from invaders, terrorists, and tyrants. That's not talking about, like in the Old Testament, Israel was commanded to go and offensively go in and attack the Canaanites and wipe them out of the land so they could conquer those lands. We're not commanded to do that. So each man will have to make the individual decision whether joining the military in his country would cause him to compromise and obey sinful orders or not. You also don't have to join the military uh, to be in shape, trained, and armed. Okay? You can be in shape, trained, and armed and not be in the military. Okay? To, so that you can be ready to protect your family, your friends, and your country. If something happens, you don't have to join the military. Okay. That's not a request, uh, prerequisite for that. Now, uh, one other thing real quick, just going along the lines of that fighting for an earthly kingdom. This is something, this is the error of two different groups of people. Number one, the Catholic church, obviously they thought that they have control over all the Kings of the earth and they can, uh, in with the crusades, go in other countries and invade countries and, take them over and establish theocracies and all these other kings are supposed to bow to the Pope and Rome and all this other junk. We know that that's a bunch of garbage that's wicked and that's false. Um, but another group too would be the post-millennial guys, which is actually a, a, a view that is, is gaining ground today, especially among the reformed crowd. Uh, a lot of these guys are post-millennial. They believe in um, dominionism, uh, theonomy. Okay, where they believe that they're going to take, they take the Christians should take over the government, and um, they they believe that um, actually they don't believe that the world's going to get worse and worse, and then the Antichrist be, is going to be revealed. They believe that we're going to make the world better and better and better, and then we're going to deliver up the kingdom to Jesus. Um, I don't subscribe to that view whatsoever. I think it's false. I think it's um, taking scripture out of context and 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 um, spiritualizing and allegorizing and making certain scriptures symbolic when they're clearly not um, in order to support their view. Uh, the Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Just talking about things getting worse. Uh, it says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, 
giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall be turned into fables. All those scriptures and more point to the fact that there shall come a falling away first, and that man of sin shall be revealed. That there will come a falling away, a getting away from sound doctrine, from deception, rising and and being becoming more prevalent the world getting worse and then the antichrist being revealed that's what the bible says and uh nowhere does it teach we're supposed to take over all the governments of the world and make the world the kingdom of god and deliver up to jesus it doesn't say that anywhere but uh, anyways i digress from there and um so that's that okay not supposed to fight for an earthly kingdom but there is i believe instances where you have to fight uh defensively okay from invaders all right war and this is this is going on to the next topic of war war is not in and of itself evil or else god would not be called a man of war first point the lord is a man of war okay we're talking about war here some people say war is always bad it's evil look at all the destruction and evil and death that it causes well You've got a problem with God because God commanded many times in the Bible for his people to engage in warfare. Okay, so let's look at the first one. First of all, the Bible describes God as the man of war. Exodus 15, 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. God is actually called a man of war. Okay, so right there, plain as day. You cannot accuse, say that war is bad in every instance or else you'd be falsely accusing God of sin if he's called the man of war. Let's look at another scripture. Isaiah 42, 13. The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Okay, this is talking about God as a man of war, he's going to go forth as a mighty man and he's fighting against his enemies. Let's look at another scripture, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. This is talking about Jesus Christ. And it says this, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Jesus makes war. So you cannot say that war is bad in and of itself. It's always evil because the Lord is a man of war and Jesus makes war. Okay? But it says in righteousness he makes war. That's the very key important distinction. There's unrighteous war and righteous war. Okay? Let's move on to the next point. God teaches the righteous how to fight in war. Okay, if war is evil in all circumstances, what is God doing teaching men how to fight in war? Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 33, God is, this is um, David speaking, I believe. And he says, God is my strength and power and he maketh my way perfect. And he maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. What is he saying? God teaches my hands to war, and what he says, that a bow of steel is broken in my arms. What does that mean? He makes him really strong. He's trained. He's exercising his body. He's getting his body stronger so that he can break a bow of steel. That's really strong. Okay? He's taught David. David's saying, God is the one that teaches my hands to war. Why would God do that if war is evil? All war is evil. Not in that case. Let's look at another one where David says he repeats the same thing. Psalm 18, verse 32. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. He says the same thing there. Let's look at another one. Psalm 144, verse 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. 
my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Three times in the Bible, David says, God, the Lord, teaches my hands to war, teaches my hands to war. He teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. God taught David how to war and how to fight. It's not evil in all instances. Now, most wars today are bad, and James gives us a reason why are they fought, why they are fought. Okay, from whence, uh, James chapter four, verse one, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? There's the key there. It's of men's lust. Most wars are fought. That's the reason. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask it amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. So, most wars are fought because of men's lusts. That's why. They kill, they desire to have, they want more, they want more, they want more. They want more resources. They want to take, they want to spoil. They want people, they want women and gold and oil and poppy fields so they can ship heroin across the sea they (laughs) they want it they want all kinds of resources okay they're fighting for that is that righteous absolutely not that is a very bad reason to fight that is an unrighteous war and here is the difference a righteous war needs to be fought by righteous people for a righteous cause in a righteous way or else it is wicked Okay, war to defend your country against an invading country is much different than fighting a war to expand your global empire and gain more resources. So that would disqualify most of the modern American wars. You know, you know, world, I don't know. And you could debate all the way back to the Civil War. I mean, the South was uh, fighting against the North because of the War of Northern Aggression. That's a whole nother rabbit trail to get into, but the the North with their radical abolitionists who were very violent and murderous people who were supported by uh, lots of heretics like Unitarians, they were very clearly the aggressors and uh, the South was defending against them themselves against them and they wanted to secede. So they got attacked. Um, was that a righteous cause? I... I mean, from what I can see, I think that looks like a pretty righteous cause. But the other wars after that, you know, World War One and Two. And I know people go crazy. Well, to, if we didn't fight against the Nazis, they would have taken over the world and all stuff. Oh yeah, well, how come the FDR knew about Pearl Harbor days before and didn't do anything about it? Uh oh. How come Henry Ford helped the Nazis? How come Prescott Bush helped the Nazis? How come IBM helped the Nazis? We could go on and on and on. I'm sorry if I just burst your bubble right there. Okay, but we could go way down that rabbit hole. If you want documentation, send me an email and I'll prove it to you beyond a shadow of a doubt. Nevertheless, Vietnam, the war in Iraq, Desert Storm, I don't see any reason for any of these wars. Not righteous whatsoever. Okay, it's not defensive. It's not for any, any good righteous purpose at all. And the war on terror is a farce. Okay? And we're not going to get into that whole topic right now. But um, the point is, is that, yes, most of the wars today are bad, but that doesn't mean, and you can't say that all wars are bad in every instance. It's not true. And you can't just say that war is bad because there's killing and destroying and and destruction. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the world that we live in because of um, sin. When sin came into the world it brought forth death but in the old testament god clearly commanded his people to kill many people he commanded them to go to war he commanded them to kill people and to uh, put people to death through capital punishment many times god people i'm sorry god commanded his people to kill okay so war isn't bad simply because people die and things get destroyed okay there has to be a specific reason and a cause okay You have to look at it from the proper perspective. All right. 
I think we covered that. If you got any more questions, ask me in the email. All right. Jesus, here's the next one. Jesus said, sell your garment to buy a sword. This is another um, commandment we have for having a weapon. Okay. And the sword was the weapon of that day that was equivalent of whatever everybody else had. Okay. So you can't say, well, it doesn't apply to guns today. It applies to whatever weapon people have today that is an equalizer. It levels the playing field so someone can't dominate you. You can't say, well, I have a sword. Okay, well, some other people have a um, handgun that can hold 17 rounds. Okay, and you're not going to stink and fight them with the sword. That's stupid. Okay? You want a weapon that can protect you from someone who's trying to kill you. It's that simple. Okay? But anyways, let's read this scripture, Luke 22, verse 35. And he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must be yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. Luke 22, verses 35 through 38. All right, two quick points here, okay? Some people try to say, it's symbolic. He didn't really mean a real sword. What he meant is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Well, you got a problem with that, okay? First of all, it wasn't symbolic, or else the purse and the script and the shoes were symbolic too. Okay, he said, likewise, his script, if he has, doesn't have a purse, let him take it. His script, let him take it. And the sword, let him take it. If he doesn't have one, even go so far as to sell your garment to buy one. Okay, if you don't have one, get one. And um, the point is, is when he sent them without purse, script, and shoes, he said, did, I, did you lack anything? And he said, nothing. And God is showing them, Jesus was teaching them no matter what your situation is, I will provide for you. I will take care of you. Okay? But he wasn't saying, I won't use means. And we're going to get into that point after this. He's saying, yeah, you can use means. He says, but now take a purse, take your script, take your shoes. But always know that you don't trust. Put your trust in the purse and the script and the shoes and then the sword. Your trust is in God first. That's what the point he was, his teaching. And God provides for us and he takes care of us in whatever state you're in, whether you be abased or whether you're bound, therewith to be content. Okay? He wasn't saying, he's talking about a symbolic sword here. Okay? It has nothing to do with the context of what he's trying to teach the lesson. Okay? And then the second point is here, he never told his disciples not to have a sword. In fact, he told them to buy one. Okay? Why would he say, go sell your garment and buy one? Jesus was teaching that God would always provide and not would always provide and not to walk by sight, but by faith. He was teaching them not to trust in physical things. This doesn't mean they never need physical things, which is exactly why he tells them to tells them, but now I tell you to buy these things, to get these things. Buy all these things and take them with you. Which ties into the next point. God always uses means, okay? This is where people go, well, I don't need a weapon or I don't need this and I don't need that. Well, let me say this, okay? You think that God doesn't use means you don't need anything and God just provides everything. Okay, let me ask you a question. God says he will provide food and clothing for you, but does that mean that you do not work to provide for food and clothing? You, do, you, do, do you honestly live your life that way and you say, well, I believe that God says he's going to provide for me. So I'm not going to work a job. I'm not going to go to the grocery store and buy food and I'm not going to buy any clothes and I'm just going to sit here and God is just going to magically provide and he's going to poof, here's clothes and here's food and here's clothing and everything and a, and a house and everything I need and here's money. Is that how it works? No. You actually have to go out physically, work a job, get money, take the money, go to the store, buy food, buy clothes. Take them home, use them, okay? God, you, but God is still providing for you. But he, you have to take some responsibility too. He uses means. 
Okay, so if he provide, he says, I'll provide for you food and clothing, but you have to go out and get the job and work for it and go buy them. It's the same thing, same thing with protection. I trust God will protect me, but I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing while someone's trying to kill me. Okay, in the same way, do you expect God to protect your family while you stand by idly and do nothing while they're attacked? Someone smashes in your window, jumps in and starts attacking your family and just say, and you sit there and you, and I'm going to pray now that God would protect my family while you stand there and do nothing. Think about how ridiculous that is. Wrong. Okay. It's wrong. Okay. Check out this point. We don't trust in the means but we still use means. All right, let's look at some scriptures that support this. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Okay, so God promises for the right. He gives a promise to the righteous that he'd keep them safe. Safety's of the Lord, but they still have the horse prepared for the day of battle. They don't go in the oath. Old Testament, they trusted in the Lord, but did they go out and battle naked? Hey, come and fight me, because we're an old, we're Israel. They just go out, they just go out there in their clothes with no weapons, no horses and chariots and nothing. Come on, Philistines, we're protected by God. Let's see what you're gonna do. No, they didn't do that. They never did that. Okay, they had horses and they prepared the horse against the day of battle. They put put armor on horses sorry i had to get a bug off this curtain here they had to uh put armor on their horses hook them up to the chariot put armor on themselves get a sword and they got all that stuff ready does that mean they didn't trust in god no absolutely they trusted in god safeties of the lord but they still prepared the horse for the day of battle let's look at another one okay uh psalm 33 Starting in verse 16, there is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse, vain, a horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. Okay? So it says clearly right here, there's no king saved by the multitude of hosts. It doesn't matter how many people you have, how big your army is. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter what what type of um, weapons you have or tanks horses it doesn't matter any of those things he said what matters is the eye of the lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy okay he will deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine very clearly the emphasis is on trusting in the lord he's the one that determines if you win or lose if you have victory in battle but that doesn't mean you don't have a host you don't have strength you don't have a horse you don't have all those things you do have all those things but you don't put your trust in them that's the point okay david said the battle is the lord's but he was the one to kill goliath with the stone from his sling he also killed his ten thousands with the sword okay was he not trusting in god because he used those means. He said the battle was the Lord's and he just sit there and he prayed and then Goliath just fell over. No, he physically took a stone, put it in his sling and chucked it at Goliath's head and it sunk in, took Goliath's sword and cut his head off. David actually had to do that. Was he not trusting in God because he did that? No, he trusted that God would help him to accomplish what he needed to do. Let's look at another example, Samson. Samson got his strength from God but he used the jawbone of an ass to kill a thousand Philistines. Why did he do that? Why didn't he just get down on his knees? God, please kill these Philistines. And then they just fell over. <sniffs> nope. He took the jawbone of an ass in his hand and he was the one that actually had to go kill him. But he got his strength from God. Okay? 
over and over and over again, this, this point is illustrated that God uses means. Men have to use weapons and other means to fight, but they don't put their trust in the means. They put their trust in God to protect them. Not, oh, because I have a bunch of bullets. I have a bunch of guns. I'm really strong. I have big muscles. I have a big army. All these other things. You don't put your trust in any of those things. You put your trust in God, but that doesn't mean you don't do anything. That you sit there and you do nothing. Like I said, it's the same thing. You don't say, well, God will provide for me money, but then you don't get out and go, go get a job. It doesn't make any sense. Okay? So let's have the proper perspective on that point. All right, we're getting down into some nitty gritty here. Okay? Last two sections here. Yep. All right. Here's some tips. All right? If we do fight, it must always be biblical. Okay, let's get the proper perspective when it comes to fighting. Okay, if we do fight, it must always be biblical. And let's look at how it needs to be biblical. Number one, we should not be looking for a fight. Okay, you don't want to, you're not running around looking for any chance and someone looks at you the wrong way to fight someone. That's wrong. Okay, try to avoid violence at all costs. Okay. Violence is not the first solution, it's the last, okay? And I'm clearly teaching this, this, that in this teaching. Do not try to say otherwise, okay? Violence is always the last option, not the first. Okay, if any in any situation, if you can run, always do that first, okay? If there's a situation like some uh, uh, someone's uh opens up in shooting or something like that, run. Run is the first option. Hiding is the second option and fighting is the last option, okay? If there's a shooting, okay? Always remember that. Always try to de-escalate a situation, which means stay calm and be careful how you talk to people who are worked up, okay? Someone's getting all worked up. Someone's mad at you. You don't try to to provoke them and say host and, and uh, be hostile and, and um, talk trash to them and, and say things that are going to make them more mad. You need to stay calm, you need to be patient, and you always try to de-escalate a situation, bring it down so that it doesn't come to violence, okay? You need to do that as much and as, as you can. As the Bible says, as much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. doesn't mean you're going to live peaceably with all men, but it means as much as lieth within you, do everything that you can to avoid escalating a situation to violence. And then uh, just another quick point is one of the qualifications for pastors is they're told not to be a brawler or a striker, okay? They're not to be running around getting in fights all the time. Like that's their character and their habit of uh, the first thing that happens is they, is someone says something wrong to them and, they, and they're quick to push and punch someone, okay? That is absolutely wrong and uh, that's unbiblical and it's a sin, by the way. Someone that likes fighting, it's totally a sin, okay? Let's look at the next point here. If you have to fight, always try to use non-lethal force to stop a threat unless your life is in danger. For instance, if someone has a firearm, ending a life is very serious and permanent, okay? If someone has a firearm and they're trying to shoot you, trying to stab you, then in that instance, it is justifiable to use f enough force to end someone's life, such as a firearm that you have to kill someone to put, put an end to their life. It's a last resort situation. It's not something you want to do, but that's the situation that goes for it. But if there's just a situation where it's like just a punching, you know, regular fight or something like that, some type of other, and if there's any other way where you can stop a situation using a non-lethal method so that someone could be placed under citizen's arrest and the cops can come take them away and they can go to court, that's what you need to do. Always try to use non-lethal force to stop a threat if you can. Next point, we should not fight over trivial matters just because you were insulted and your ego was hurt, okay? Again, that's where the turn the other cheek teaching comes into play. Someone insults you, there's a slap on the cheek, someone spit on you when you're street preaching or something like that. Uh, someone insults you, called you a name, put you down. That is never an excuse to fight. Never an excuse to use physical violence, okay? You just need to take it patiently, not get upset, and if you do get upset and you want to punch, it's because you're proud, okay? And you got a pride problem, okay? We're not supposed to fight over trivial matters. Next point, we should not jump in every situation that we see to be a hero meddling with others' strife, okay? 
Uh, that's why the Bible has that proverb, and it says, if you um, pass, if you're um, meddling with, str- I forget how the scripture goes, but meddling with strife that you pass by, it's like taking a dog by the ears, okay? You know, you don't, you're not supposed to meddle in everything. Like I said, a lot of times, man, especially when you got a, a girl and a guy fighting, a lot of times that can be real dangerous. You think like, hey, what are you doing? And this guy's being come, getting physical with a, a woman. Sometimes it is important and you do need to to step in but uh sometimes it can get uh that the woman will actually turn on you it's happened multiple multiple times many times ask any law enforcement or anybody that has experience with those things and they will tell you the same exact thing okay obviously if some guy's like beating a woman down to the ground you need to go step in to try to stop it but um you know if you see something that looks pretty sketchy then yeah maybe you should call the cops but um and keep an eye on things, but just be careful. You can't just in, in, intervene in everything. You see two people fighting in a fist fight on the side of the road, you know, maybe just call the cops, you know, just some people getting in a stupid fight or something. You know, we're talking about serious situations. Someone's life is being threatened. Um, someone's being oppressed. Like it says, the fatherless, the widow, clearly an innocent victim that's being brutalized and oppressed, you need to step in and stop it. But you don't be quick to jump in every situation. Be very um, critically analyze the situation before you intervene. All right, let's look at another one. We must never seek personal revenge against anyone. Okay, if someone has escaped after committing a crime, it must be left up to the civil government to execute justice on them, okay? Unfortunately, sometimes if something happens, even if it is murder, and the crime's already done, the, the criminal's gone. It is not up to us to go hunt that person down, find them, and take revenge upon them. They stole something from you, go find them and, and uh, beat them down. That's not biblical, okay? We can't seek personal personal revenge against anyone uh, if they've escaped. In fact, um, the laws of the civil government in our land are are that if someone is running away and they're no longer a threat to our life and you shoot them, you can be in serious trouble and maybe even guilty of manslaughter if they die, okay? Because if you shot someone in the back, um, it looks like they were running away. So you got to be very, very careful when it comes to that stuff. Um, But anyways, the point is never seek personal revenge. You're only using uh, deadly force when someone is trying to, is threatening your life, okay? Uh, never, here's another next point, never put your trust in your muscles or weapon, only God do not walk around like Rambo. Okay. So that's like what we talked about, not trusting in the, in your means. Okay. Just cause you work out and you get really strong and you got some awesome, some guns and stuff like that. Do not put your trust in that. Okay. Just cause you got thousands of rounds of ammunition and all this other stuff and you got sweet rifles and all the stuff. It do- doesn't matter. It does not matter. You don't put your trust in those things. You put your trust in God. Okay. And you're not walking around with the attitude like, yeah, I'm the man and, and, and you're super tough and you're rambling and stuff. That is not godly. And uh, tactically also, it's not very smart. Um, you don't want to be the guy that's showing off. And we're going to talk about practical tips about that later. That you're not the guy like, hey, look at me. And and you got your, uh, you're showing off to everyone that you know what you're doing. Well, you're just making yourself a target. But um, we're going to get to that in a second. All right, next point. Sometimes there are situations where we have no choice but to suffer and deal with an attack, especially when it comes to preaching the gospel and standing for righteousness. This is not a situation where you're protecting your family or other innocent people. In this scenario, we need to just pray for faith and patience to endure the trial that God may get the glory. Jesus is our example to look to for enduring suffering. Many saints also endured torture and death for standing for the faith throughout history, throughout that time of persecution. Uh, They maintained a good testimony, okay? So we know thousands and millions of saints throughout history were tortured, murdered, killed throughout history by the Catholic Church, especially in other groups, and they were martyred. And they took it patiently. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, they were sawn asunder, they were stoned, and all these other things. Hey, sometimes that's going to happen. Maybe you're uh, overwhelmed by a group of people. You don't have any weapons or your weapons aren't going to do anything. And that's it. You're dead. Well, guess what? If it's your time to die, you're going to die. 
And if God deems that it's time for you to suffer, Paul the Apostle will suffer a lot. He um, he was whipped many times. I think he, he received, what was it, like almost 90 stripes or something like that. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned, uh, suffered shipwreck, all these different things. He was persecuted and he took it patiently. Okay. So sometimes that's going to happen, but especially when you're preaching the gospel, that's that's a clear time where violence is just, it's not, that's not the option. That's not the instance where you need to be using violence, okay? Uh, for instance, if while you're preaching on the street, someone spits on you or pushes you, take it patiently and do not retaliate or return reviling for reviling. This is different than someone pulling a knife or a gun on you, okay? You want to put a stop to someone that's trying to kill you, okay? Someone's trying to do that, knife you or kill you. You got to, you're obligated to stop that or trying to kill your your friend. You know, you want to stop that, get the weapon out of their hand, do whatever it takes to subdue them and deliver them to the civil government. But, uh, you know, like I said, someone spits on you, pushes you, punches you or something like that while you're preaching. Take it patiently. Take it patiently. Don't curse them out. Don't push them back. Um, return reviling for reviling. Someone says something nasty to you. Don't shout down the street something nasty back at them. All that type of stuff. Be patient, be long suffering, and maintain a good testimony that God would get the glory and that you wouldn't bring shame to the Lord's name and take the Lord's name in vain. Okay? All right. So that's under that. If you do fight, it must always be biblical. So some of the those are some of the guidelines when it comes to uh, fighting biblically. Okay. And then the last section here that we're going to cover is practical tips. Okay. We'll cover that real quick. Um, this could be a whole much more in depth, but I'm just giving you guys some of these points. Uh, if you need to learn more, you can send me an email. Uh, I can recommend some stuff that you can study, maybe some YouTube channels or something, but let's talk about some practical tips. Number one, you need to stay in shape and train your body to be able to protect your family other innocent people, and to be able to run away from danger. This includes learning a few basic self-defense techniques, okay? Uh, like I said before, man, uh, men's bodies were made to grow muscle, okay? We were made to work with our hands and to be able to fight. The bo- David said, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in my arms and he teacheth my fingers to fight, okay? So, you, um, the Bible says bodily exercise profiteth little, little, but exercise thyself rather to godliness. That means it's way more important to spiritually exercise yourself to become godly, holy, get sin out of your life, all these other types of things. Yes, that is most important, but it doesn't say bodily exercise profiteth little. I mean, I'm sorry, it does say that. It doesn't say that it profits nothing, Okay. So it does have some profit. It's just saying spiritually speaking, it doesn't have much value but it does have value, okay? And if you don't move your body and and exercise and and, uh, train your body, you're not gonna be able to protect your family. You get a wife and kid and someone does something and you're a scrawny little weakling and you can't even do anything, you're just gonna get pummeled, okay? Makes no sense, okay? You gotta gotta strengthen your muscles a little bit. Do some calisthenics, do some push-ups and pull-ups and pull-ups are one of the best things you can do. Just get a pull-up bar off Amazon and snaps in your doorway real quick. You don't even need any screws and you're good. Practice that. Dips, um, planks, and all kinds of stuff like that. You don't even need to go to the gym. Um, punching bags, stuff like that. Just keep yourself in shape. It's also really good for your health and um, because once you hit it over the age of 30, your testosterone levels start to drop. And one of the ways to increase testosterone levels is through exercise. Exercise is also one of the best ways to get rid of stress in your body. Okay, so exercise is very important for you, uh, especially as you get older. So that's a practical tip with that. Uh, here's the next one. If you carry a firearm, You need to train yourself how to use it and practice regularly or else you'll not be ready to deal with the threat. It is said that you only perform 50% as good under pressure as you would normally, which means you need to train muscle memory and reflexes, especially to react quickly enough. Uh, Very true. Very true. I've seen a lot about this. I've studied this 
And um, so you got to practice. And one of the most important things, even beyond practicing, like shooting at a target, is drawing your gun quickly. Just getting it out of your holster, getting it out of your pocket. Draw it, draw it, draw it, draw it. You had getting ready quick enough because drawing your gun and having it ready, that's the that's the thing that um, people have the most trouble with. And in situations like that, when it comes into emergency situation, they have trouble getting the firearm out quick enough and ready to shoot. Okay. So that's something you need to train with. Um, and, you know, if you don't train, you're not going to be ready. You're not on, you can't fool yourself. If you don't shoot it, you're going to lose it. Okay. It's uh, an important thing to do. All right. Next, uh, criminals, this is tied in with that previous point. Criminals can tell if you're confident with the firearm and will, and if will, you will use it or not. Okay. Um, there have been police officers that have taken, um, prisoners out of jail and they had them sit down with them gave them a bologna sandwich and some and some soda and just let them talk to them and tell them and it was amazing what some of these criminals would tell police officers and they tell them how they profile people criminals were very smart about this how they would size people up watch them and and they look for sought what are known as soft targets easy targets and uh and criminals would say they had guns pulled on them and they could tell if that person was going to shoot or not okay so just brandishing a gun will not scare away a criminal 80 percent of the time which has been documented by law enforcement okay law enforcement document 80 percent of the time just pulling it out you think that's just going to scare them away it's not okay they can tell if you've used it before and if you will use it okay so don't think that you're going to bluff uh, it is also illegal to brandish a weapon unless you intend to use it to eliminate a threat to your life. Okay, that's another practical tip when it comes to gun laws. You just to let you know, you can get in serious trouble if you just pull out your gun, gun, and just wave it at someone. If you don't, if you're not, if you don't, if your life isn't under threat, uh, you can't fire off warning shots either. That's against the law. You're not allowed to fire a warning shot. That's totally. Uh, bad something false that you should never do no warning shots no pulling out the gun and brandishing at someone the only time the law says that you should pull out a firearm is if you're ready to shoot and the only time you should shoot someone is if your threat that your life is under imminent threat of of your life being taken away okay if you're if your life is in imminent danger that's the only way is you're eliminating a threat to your life is when you're allowed to pull out a firearm and use it okay so do not brandish a gun don't fire off warning shots that is stupid all right two more points use wisdom you don't need to open carry and needlessly needlessly draw attention to yourself just to exercise your rights quote unquote i think open carry honestly is stupid uh someone comes into a place and they're going to shoot it up and they see you with your gun on your hip you are going to be the first one that they shoot okay so tactically you have a very um poor advantage you have a disadvantage in a situation like that uh it's totally dumb open carry is not smart at all uh definitely conceal carry and um last and but not least definitely not least is situational awareness situational awareness is the most important skill to have to avoid danger or conflict okay you need to practice situational awareness okay um situational awareness is the most important skill to avoid anything danger and conflict so it's not just that you want to to learn how to get out of a dangerous situation you want to avoid a da dangerous situation okay and how you do that and it's kind of like the color code system that this guy came up with about situational awareness uh code white is what most people average american walks around and they're completely distracted they're completely ignorant of everything going on around them. They're oblivious. They're relaxed. They have no idea. They're not paying attention. A lot of people are looking down at their phones. They're texting. They're they're not paying attention. And uh, they make themselves easy targets. If something happens, they're totally caught off guard. They freeze. They get hurt. They don't know what to do. You never want to be in white. Never want to be in code white. And except maybe if you're like inside your house relaxing or something in a safe spot. Otherwise, you don't want to be in, in white as when you're out and about in public, especially if you're in a city, you do not want to be in code white. Code yellow, okay, is when you're alert and you're aware of your surroundings, constantly being aware of your surroundings, but you're not paranoid, walking around, um, you know, stressed out, constantly 
looking around every corner, thinking something's about to happen. That's stupid. And you're going to get tired of that. Okay. Code yellow was just, you're aware every time you, when you walk into a building, you walk out of a building, you're looking left, you're looking right, you're keeping your eyes moving. You're looking at baselines to make sure, uh, to see what would be normal. If something looks out of the ordinary, someone looks out of the ordinary, something looks suspicious, you're just keeping your eyes moving. You're aware of your surroundings. You're just paying attention. That's all there is to it. Okay. You're doing it while you're driving, while you're walking, and especially when you're in a city, you're paying attention. Okay. And then we got two more colors. Code orange is when something suspicious does pop up. Okay. You see something suspicious. It looks like something potentially could be happening. You instantly become in a heightened sense of awareness. Your adrenaline starts pumping and you now need to get ready for the potential scenario. So in your mind, you're going to rattle off a bunch of potential scenarios of what could happen. Say if this, and you need to think about what you're going to do beforehand to respond. If this person does this, you're going to do this. If this happens, then you're going to do this. Then you're thinking about if I'm going to run, if this happens, I'm going to run. Where am I going to run? How fast? I'm going to go this way. What's the route? Uh, if I'm going to have to pull out my gun, how am I going to do it? What am I, when am I going to pull it out? All these different situations. Okay. You have to think about that beforehand and you're getting ready when something happens. And then of course, code red is, there's an imminent threat to your life. You have to take action. And that's when the, the time when you're going to be pulling out your firearm, but you already know what you're going to do, or you're going to have to fight with your hands. Um, and you're taking action. Okay. So that color code system kind of helps you understand situational awareness a little bit. Um, you could study it a little bit more, uh, do some research yourself about it, but situational awareness is something you need to practice. Now start practicing situational awareness. Now avoid dangerous situations. If something looks sketchy, it looks suspicious, something weird's going on, get out of that area immediately. Okay. The biggest problem the, that people have that gets them hurt or killed is when they freeze. Okay. You need to get off the X, get off the mark as people say, okay, you get off the X where the sit the, the place where something bad is happening. You need to react quickly. And the way that you react quickly is you already have thought in your mind beforehand what you're going to do. Okay. So start the time is not to, to think is not when something happens or right before it's now you plan in your head. Hey, if something happens this is what I'm going to do. So then when it happens, you already know what you're going to do when you do it. I'm going to run. I'm going to pull out my firearm. I'm going to fight. I'm going to do this. But most of the time you need to know when to run. Okay. And you can't run if you're smoking a bunch of cigarettes and sitting on the couch all day and you never exercise. You can't even run. Okay. Is there something unbiblical about running? Are you going to say it's wrong to run now? Okay. How can you, oh, well, exercise. That's, it says the bodily exercise profit is little. Well, how are you going to run um, from a bad situation? If something happens, what if a pff, something explodes and a fire breaks out and you get to run out of the area? You know, uh, you're not going to be doing very good if you don't exercise. Okay. So get those lungs pumping. Start exercising and you're going to feel good. You're going to feel better. All right. All right. So those are some of the practical tips. Just wanted to throw those in there. But um, I guess that's it. Yeah, that's that's the end of the teaching today. So we just talked about some commandments to protect your family, your property, strangers, uh, top military service and war and some practical tips. Okay. So that completes the second part to this teaching and the whole teaching about should Christians use violence. Uh, the topic of self-defense, and I hope that you are now convinced that it is okay in certain situations to use violence. And in fact, it is a commandment to protect and to use violence in certain situations. And it is a sin to turn the other way if a uh, someone's trying to be hurt. Like for instance, if a woman's being raped and you turn away, hey, I didn't see that. Well, God knows that you did and you didn't do anything about it. So that's a sin. All right. Uh, so I hope this was edifying to you. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you, uh, continue to study this out, may, take some notes. Um, and, uh, I hope it was a blessing to you. And I hope that you take the, these truths though, and don't just listen to it and be a hearer only, but be a doer of the word. And you should put these principles into application and, and apply them to your life. All right. So. 
Thanks for watching. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, share these videos, start spreading them around. We got some more teachings lined up for the future. Uh, I'm going to be talking about actually some prophecy coming up soon, but I got some other teachings, especially doctrinal coming up. Doctrinal is very important. Please watch the doctrinal teachings. Um, and don't just watch ones that are about exciting, you know, topics or something like that. Uh, I don't want to be, I'm not going to be chasing news headlines or anything, any junk like that. I don't think that that's, um, that's not edifying and that's not going to feed you with the word of God. Uh, maybe sometime every now and then it's, it's okay. Maybe I will talk about something that happens in the news, but other than that, it's just going to be some dedicated teachings, Bible studies and stuff like that. And, uh, we'll see, get it. I got a lot of stuff to cover soon, so please stay tuned. Thank you. Please pray for me and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. God bless and have a good night.